Okay. Okay, so um, empathy is a fancy name for kind of being kind, which I think you were speaking about earlier. And kindness is something that is in us. We don't necessarily have to be taught to be kind. If, so, if we have grown up with kindness, it's easier to be kind. If we, are in an, if we are working in a culture of kindness, and we're noticing it in our colleagues, in our mentors, if we're noticing it around us, it makes it more easy. But there are certain empathic skills, which are similar to counseling skills, that we can learn and practice to help us just be aware of what we can do to connect more effectively with patients. And this is especially helpful when we're in an emergency situation or we're in a very busy, overwhelming situation like a labor ward where there's lots going on, we're tired, we're worried, we might not have the equipment, we might feel, be feeling overwhelmed. It's sometimes helpful just to go back to some of these principles of empathic care. Empathy is, is if we dissect it down to its simplest concept, it's, it's not uh, necessarily about doing things. And as health workers, we are trained to do all the time. We're trained to see there's a problem, I must do this, and then I must do that. And we forget to be. We forget to be with the patient. And we need to remember that we are essentially human beings and not necessarily human doings. And being with is part of um, a very basic African philosophy. And if you think about it, if you're walking in the streets and you stub your toe on a rock, what are, you, what are people going to say to you? Or if, let's imagine you see somebody doing that. What is going to come out of you before you even think? Sorry. Sorry. In is it closer? You would say, Polo. What, what else would you say? In Zulu. In Afrikaans, sorry? What, what words would you use? In Afrikaans, you'd say, Yammer or shame. Okay. Ach, shame. If you did that in America, if you did that to somebody in America, they'd say, why? Why are you saying sorry? You didn't push me. They won't understand what you, what you mean. They'll think you've been mad. <laughs> but what, is, what are you actually saying when you're saying, I'm sorry? I feel for you. A bit more, what else are you saying? Yes, you're imagining what it must be like. I'm with you. I'm with you in this. Not necessary that I caused it. I'm not necessarily going to fix it. I'm just with you. I am with you. And very often that's what we need. Tembisa needed somebody to be with her more than anything else. So that is what empathy is about. And there's six useful skills for empathic engagement. And I'm going to quickly speak through the different skills and then we're going to practice them around a case. Um, this is what we're taught as clinicians, as providers, that we need to have privacy. We need to make a safe space. Okay? When you go into somebody's home, when you're welcomed into somebody's ward, into somebody's setting, you need to say, this is a place where you will be safe. You need to communicate that with people and you can communicate that with them non-verbally as well as verbally. We, we want to connect with a person, build rapport. That's another thing that we do in this country. We greet people. We train our children how to greet. It's not acceptable to the house. Okay? We have to, when we greet, when we train our children, when we teach our children the importance of greeting, it's the same principles. It's about respecting another person and saying, I want you to come into my space and you are an important person in this space where you will be safe. And you can connect with a person. That warmth makes all the difference. That motherliness makes all the difference to how the rest of the labor is going to progress. It will make a person feel comfortable and relaxed. Okay? And what is that going to do to the progress of labor? When somebody is feeling stressed versus feeling comfortable, 
What are, what's happening? Does anyone know what's happening from, an, from a hormone point of view? Different hormones are released when you are stressed. Your brain sends messages all the way down the system to release different hormones when you are stressed from when you are relaxed and calm. And those hormones that are involved in the stress response stop the progress of labor. Okay? They make the uterine contractions less efficient. Okay? So if, if we're wanting to bathe the uterus, the womb, in an environment of the best hormones for contraction, we want that person's emotional state to be such that, that these are optimal. So we can have an informal conversation with people, take an interest in their concerns, calm, create, feel, we must feel agents of the, of the culture of our ward. We can make the culture of our ward. It depends on, on us. Trying to understand the patient's perspective. Try to remember this exercise. How is this patient thinking? What is she feeling? What does she actually need? What is her perspective? Okay, even if she's a 43-year-old, grab six, even if she's a 14-year-old who's, who's being rude, what, what is her perspective? What might she be feeling? We've spoken about not, not sharing our own frustrations, about having another space, another time to deal with our own frustrations. Our own baggage is there. It's not going to disappear. That suitcase is there. But deciding when we're going to manage that is, is important. Simply, if you remember the exercise where we introduced ourselves non-verbally, the power of non-verbal communication, how we show friendliness and care, and that leads on to how we communicate non-verbally. They have shown in studies that when people speak to somebody else, 70% of the message that you pick up is not the words. It's the non-verbal. So it is much more important for us to pay attention to how we communicate than what it is we're communicating. And how often are we saying to people, you must remember this, this and this and this, or you must do this, otherwise that's going to happen. And it's simply that tone of voice and that way of communicating that makes people less able to take that information in. So it's really about the how, how we use our eyes how we use our bodies, our voice. What do we do? Do we touch a person? Sometimes it's not appropriate to do that. Do we, do, do we use um, their name? How do we use their name? Do we look in their eyes? Sometimes that's culturally appropriate, sometimes it isn't. And then verbally, are we asking a whole lot of questions according to our own agenda, a tick list? Have you had any allergies? Are you allergic? Have you had any medical problems? Any any um, operations, how many children have you had before, how many miscarriages, yes, no questions, okay. What does that do to the relationship? It what? It breaks it. it, breaks it. This is me asking, it, <laughs> it becomes clinical and it's about my agenda as a health worker and of course we need to ask those questions and of course we need to have a history and understand but we can't just do that. We do need to give the person a time and a place to talk and articulate what it is they're feeling. Okay, okay. I think we should start then. Um, is it a problem if we leave this door open? Because I think it's really quite... Will it be too noisy? Okay, all right. Um, okay, so when we ask... When we ask people questions, when we really want to know what their opinion is, what they think, what they feel, we're saying to them, your experience is important, your opinion is important, your story is important, just as it is. Who, who you are and what you want to say is important. And when people feel, feel that you think that, they feel, they, we say there's a sense of agency. And they will be partners with us in the labor, as opposed to us doing stuff to them, telling them things, asking them things. Okay. So as health workers, we're trained to tell and, to, and to, to, to tell people what to do and to ask factual information. 
but we need to work on a way to find out from people how how are you feeling in yourself can you tell me what's what's what is your story what what do you need right now can you tell me more how do you feel about this what has been happening do you think maybe if we if we did it this way that might work we ask a question with respect okay it's very important to be able to reflect the feelings. So earlier we were trying to identify the feelings of the health worker and our, uh, ourselves and the feelings of the, of the patient. But very often people aren't aware of their own feelings. So sometimes we need to say to somebody, we need to put up that mirror and say, it seems to me that you're feeling very afraid. Or am I right? Things are feeling all too much for you right now. We need to be able to show to somebody, I respect you enough to want to know how it is you are feeling inside yourself. And I might get it wrong, so I ask it respectfully, am I right? You're very angry right now with what's happening in this labor ward. Or you're feeling, you're feeling a bit lost, am I right? Um, and that says to a person, I'm interested in you for who you are, not whether you're allergic to penicillin or not. But I'm interested in you, not for how many centimeters you are, but because you're feeling afraid and lonely. And that says, says to the person, you care for them and you're empathic with them. And we do not want to tell the person, you shouldn't feel angry, or you must feel better, or don't worry, That'll, that feeling will go away. All we are doing is putting up a mirror to reflect. That's all we need to do. We don't need to do much more than that. We need to be gentle about this because it might be wrong. So these are the things that we can say. It seems as if you're very angry. You seem afraid and uncertain. Am I right? This makes the patient feel valuable and she is much more likely to be able to hear your message. It builds the trust. Then, how often do we tell our colleagues, our partners, our family members, never mind our patients, when they are doing something well? I noticed in your teaching you did that a lot. Okay, and it feels great for somebody to say to you, you've got it, well done, that's an interesting thing. When a person is feeling vulnerable and afraid, remember Tembisa, she's uncertain, she's not sure, she doesn't know, to find something in her to hook that out and to say, that was well done. You have, even if it's a small thing, like you have grown a beautiful sized baby, well done, your body has grown this good baby. I see you have come for all your clinic visits. That must have been really tough for you. If you, your, your contractions are strong and they're working well to open up the womb, those little things you are saying to somebody, you are capable, you are able, you are doing something right. And many people are never told that. Many people are never told that they're doing something well. So it's encouraging. Um, we can support their choices, their knowledge, their behavior. This makes them feel powerful. And if you feel empowered, your labor is going to progress better. We can normalize the patient's feelings. So if somebody is feeling terrified or scared, we can say that's okay. It's typical to feel very scared at this point in the labor. You know that feeling around nine centimeters when people don't, they're feeling a bit panicky? You can normalize that. that this is a normal time for nine centimeters dilation. And it means that the baby's ready to come. It's okay to feel this way. It doesn't mean that terrible things are going to happen. It's similar to what, would, what others feel at this stage. We need to make sure that what we're suggesting to somebody makes sense to them. So if we say to them, walk up and down the corridor, it'll help the labor progress. Or if we say to them, phone your family, to, bring, to have somebody come here to be with you. Is that something that works for them or not? Is there a reason that we don't understand? Does it make sense to them, our suggestions, our advice? We need to, we need to do a, a vaginal examination right now 
because we are thinking that maybe the baby's cord has come down and we want to just check if something has happened. Um, or we want to see how far the, womb, the mouth of the womb is opening. We need to check that that means something to her and that, she's, that that suggestion makes sense to her. It respects and empowers the person. It acknowledges that she has choice. We're not doing things to her. Um, it, it, if she doesn't understand something, it, it's a little reminder to us that we need to explain something a bit better. How would that? What do you think about this? Would you be comfortable doing that? And we need to share knowledge. We spoke about a lot of people simply don't know what does, what does it mean? Why am I having to have a Caesar? Why are you doing another PV on me? What does this pain in my back mean? I thought I should have pain over here. Why have I vomited? People sometimes just need a little bit of knowledge to get over those, the fears about those things. It's not the same as giving instructions or advice. Knowledge sharing is much more neutral. If I'm giving instructions or advice, it's my agenda. You must not smoke. Okay? Very, it's bad to smoke. Very different from sitting with somebody and sharing knowledge in a neutral way about the dangers of what it means to smoke. And does somebody think that they may want to stop? And how do they think they may want to do that? It needs to be in the ways and the language that people understand. We understand what is a CTG, if we, and we know it, it's our language, right? But if we say, I'm going to put the CTG around you, to the average mother out there, what is the CTG? That sounds scary. What does it mean? Does it mean I've got something wrong? We just need to, to be careful about the language we use in obstetrics. And quite often we use a language that is quite demeaning. If you think about it, failure to progress, trial of scar, incompetent cervix. All that language is saying you are useless. <laughs> okay, we must be very careful about the language that we use. Um, we don't want to use technical words and if we share knowledge we can really effectively address fears especially if we do it in a way that's empathic so here are the six skills and we're going to go through another scenario where we're going to do it slightly differently we need a chair for a patient and we need another chair for the health worker and we're going to have one patient, and then we're going to have a rotating health worker. Okay. So a lot of us are going to have a chance to be the health worker for this patient. And what we're going to do now is we're going to be res modeling respectful empathic care and keep reflecting back on these skills and try and use these skills as you can. All right, you don't have to do it in that order. And you might only do one or two in your little interaction. You don't have to do all of them. But try and use those skills as you are the doctor for this lady or the nurse for this lady. Okay? You are Bukelwa. Bukelwa, you are graph two, para one. And you have been in active labor now for six hours. Between your last pregnancy and this one, your boyfriend raped you after you broke up with him. You are all health worker Pumza. You have had a very busy shift in labor ward and you're working extra shifts this week because you've got big financial problems. So you're working extra hours. And you also have a very painful back. That's you. Okay. Pumza. Health worker Pumza and Bukelwa, could you please, could you please connect with your patient who, and use uh, some of those skills that we spoke about now? Bukelwa. 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 Okay, and I would like all of us to notice how this, this health worker Pumza what she does, how she works and uses those empathic skills. Maybe we would do it slightly differently. Okay. Okay, 
Can you try and speak in English for the video? Okay, when did your labor start? It started at 7 this morning. At 7 this morning. Is this your first baby? No, it's my second baby. It's your second baby. So you know how the labor pains are. Is there anything that is troubling you except your labor pains? As I've told the roots, I have a contraction, nothing else. Okay, Susie. Okay, we're going to we're going to use excellent. We're going to use a pause, and we're going to reflect on this health worker. What did this health worker do? Which skills did she do very effectively? Yes. But which of the six empathic skills? What did she use? She built rapport. How did she build rapport? How, yeah, how? She did more than smile. Yeah. She made physical contact. I introduced herself personally as well as getting the patients. Okay, and she did it in a culturally appropriate way, in the way she greeted. Yes? Yes? Her face. She was smiling, a nice face for you to talk freely to the healthcare worker. Her whole being, her whole energy was one of gentleness and respect, wasn't it? Um, okay, let's thank you very much. We want to give other people an opportunity. Can we have another um, patient? Who would like to be the, the patient? Bukelwa. Thank you, Bukelwa. Okay. <laughs> um, Okay, and we need, um, Bacala, now you feel like your pain is taking over. Okay, you're actually in the bed. We must pretend this is a bed. Now your pain is taking over, and your legs seem to stay closed when the male doctor on duty wants to come and do a vaginal examination. And you're writhing around in the bed, and then after a difficult and painful examination, the, the, doc the, 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 the doctor says, now you can push, and he goes away. All right? All right, Pumza, one of you are going to be Pumza, the health worker. Your colleague goes off for lunch. Now, this Bukewa says she's not going to push. She says she can't push. She wants an operation. And I want you to start screaming for this operation. I want you to say, I'm going to die. I want you to thrash around on the bed. Um, and, and health worker, you can't hear the fetal heart because the... Because she's, she's, it's, so eventually you feel it with the fetoscope and you can reassure her that the fetal heart is still there. Um, but you're also being called on the intercom because there's another la lady who's about to deliver. Okay. Health worker, can you please come and be here? Punza, can you please be with Bukelwa and use as many of those skills as you can? <laughs> She is your patient. Okay, so I need you to be flattening around, screaming, okay, screaming. You want to see them, you want to see them. Take one of the obstetricians. Yes, yeah. obstetric doctors. Victor. Okay. Bukelwa is screaming. Um, yeah, she's Bukelwa. You are Pumza. Bukelwa, you are screaming and you want. You don't want to push, you want that baby out now. Should I just be now? Yes, I want you to be, become the patient, become the patient. Yeah. 
She didn't really want another examination. He gave, in what way did he give her support? He says, I'm going to help her. He explained that he was going to help, yes? Okay, great. Now I want the next, uh, ex I want the next help worker to come and reflect the feelings. That's the difficult skill here. Who feels that they can come and do the reflection of the feelings, number three. You've had your turn. You want to try, yeah. Dr. Lily? <laughs> okay. You must, okay, so what we want now is for the patient to be very uncooperative, okay? <laughs> and to insist that the baby's going to die, scream that the baby's going to die. I want you to say you cannot push. There's no ways you can push. And that you want this baby out okay remember the trauma that you've experienced before i want you to behave like a person who has been through all of that okay let's see if dr lily can put up a mirror to reflect the feelings Not what your feelings are. Oh, yes. yes, exactly. Yeah. She's feeling angry, right? So yeah. just reflect that. At this point, I, at this point, you have to be angry about this. You know, it's, this pain is unbearable. It's difficult. To sure, I have to. You didn't have to. Take this out of time. Take the baby out. I don't care if it's going to be the same. These are for every day. I know. 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 Oh, and the nurses keep on telling me I'm out as much and much. I need this thing to be taken out. Yes, and the way of walking around, you have to do that. I have to give you the same thing. I know. You know, I'm not going to do that. Okay, good. Excellent. Okay. Okay. So, she picked up this was an angry person, okay? I don't want to Okay, so the important thing is to pick up what the person is feeling, okay, and not to tell them that it's good or bad, or that it must do, it must change, but what it is. Just say what it is. Remember the, the, the exercise of reflecting. What is this, what is the feeling here? And then you often find that when you reflect the feeling, the person doesn't have to scream because they feel they've been heard. You've got me. You understand my feelings, so I don't have to keep convincing you what I'm feeling, because you get it. Um, so that often actually helps to bring down, bring down the level of stress in the room. Okay, um, that's the end of my section. Thank you. Last bits. So, um, 
the next bit is just about the safety aspect of child. So we had the res respectful thing. So the next bit is around the safety. And the WHO has recently developed and disseminated internationally a WHO, the WHO Safe Childbirth Checklist. I'm not sure if it's been used in your facilities yet. It's, there's one that's been used at Caesarean section. Yes. Yeah. And now we're moving on to the one in the labor ward. Okay. Um, so that's one way of monitoring safety in childbirth, uh, pregnancy and childbirth. The other thing, uh, after we try to change the way we do things with and for patients, in terms of respecting them, um, providing efficient quality care, how do we know it's, gonna, it's working? We have to get feedback, all right? And one way of doing that as patient exit questionnaires, I'm not sure if you use it in your facilities, um, or interviewers for that matter, but obviously it needs to be done in a, in a way that the patient feels open enough to say what, they re what their experience really was and what their opinion is. Um, do you have complaints and compliments monitoring um, processes? Yes. Okay, so there is, it does get documented, but what gets done with that information? The readers, okay, depending on what it is. And if there are compliments, are people actually told that a patient had this to say about their experience here? Yes. Yes. All right, because we're quick to jump onto the complaints but we need to also, there are some good things and people need to be made aware and encouraged to continue that kind of um, behavior and care that they provide, all right. And in obstetrics particularly, we don't do this debriefing thing after very, very bad situations, a massive hemorrhage, shoulder dystocia. Do we actually go back and regroup whoever was involved with it? Do we actually talk and debrief them about the situation because this is traumatic for them too. And sometimes yeah. that debriefing needs to happen not only after terrible things, <coughs> but just after after a month. So how's it going? How 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 are people feeling? What's what's how are people's mental health status? It doesn't have to be after a, a terrible event. A regular type of thing. Proactive, preventive thing. Or even if something good happened. To debrief around that. What is it? That was amazing, guys. How did, How did we get this right? And then to work on that. Because debriefing is not only about what was negative, but it was what was positive, and to encourage that. Okay? On an ongoing basis. Okay. Um, so the WHO Safe Childbirth Checklist has four components, and there are 29 items in it. I'm just going to breeze through it. So the one component is what needs to be checked for when the woman is admitted. Okay, and this details all of that there, right? Do things like, does she need a referral elsewhere? Is she in the right place? Okay, because you have to then check those and then you work your way down the checklist. This will obviously be adapted for local use. This is not um, in, in place yet, okay, but it will come. So we're just sensitizing you to it, all right? <laughs> so what happens on admission? What happens just before she starts to push? Do we have gloves? Do we have oxytocin? Right. Those are the kinds of things we need to, to check for. If it's not there, something needs to be done. So this can be used as a monitoring tool as well and an evaluation tool. Okay, so as it's happening or in retrospect. Okay. As soon as the baby's out, what have we done there? Are we checking her vitals? 15 minute, at 15 minute intervals after that first hour? Are we checking how much blood loss there is? Does she need uh, uh, drugs, the uh, PMTCT stuff? Has the baby been given that? So it's all those kinds of things. And what happens before she goes home? Is there a plan for follow up? Does she know where to go? Does she have the medication she needs? Those kinds of things. Are we clear? So that's just that in a nutshell. Right? So, but this is in the presentation which you all will get on, on your disc at some point, so you can just go through it, or you can just find it on the web, it's easily available there. All right, so this is a, an example of um, a patient survey, so depending on where she was seen, you can ask questions, and it's very simple, kind of yes, no, happy, sad, and comments, all right? How do you feel about the way you were treated by the staff? Happy? No. Oh, yes. All right. 
Right. Oh. And this is this is what you use to monitor the patient's experience. Yes. Yeah. All right. You can save their lives, but if the experience was bad, you know, it, it, it just tarnishes it for them. Okay. So this is a way of monitoring if you if you're doing the right thing. And this must uh, this can't be done under your direct term. Um, just fill this in. I want to see what you're doing. You give it to the patient, give them time to, and then just pop it somewhere. They don't have to give it back to you directly. All right, because you watching them is going to give you skewed data. All right. Okay, are there any questions? Before that, before that please to, to know that it is, before you train others, it is very helpful for you to read through this, um, which walks you through the, the exercises that we did. And, and it guides you on the kind of discussion that you can lead the group. It okay. gives you the stories of the different case scenarios mm. and the kind of discussion framework that you want to have afterwards. Any okay. comments or questions? Questions, yeah. I mean, uh, last night, let's see what was shown. Mm. I, uh, I just want to check with you because we're not using uh, this one as is. We have our own. Yes, no, I mean, this is just an example. It's not, you don't have to use this particular one. You use what is relevant and appropriate for you. <laughs> we just put this in here, sorry, as, as an example. Okay, no, it's fine. I just wanted to be okay. clear because the questions are the same, but the format is different. No, that's fine. That's absolutely fine. Absolutely fine. Okay. Any other comments? Yes, I think every time we, we, we see a patient, we need to think about this lecture and remember it and utilize whatever we've learned going forward. Great stuff. Thank you. What are you taking away? Um, I've learned a lot. Um, we're going to take away when we're doing training things that we often miss the, the skills, especially that we look at the reflecting back, the communication skills. That's so. good. No, what are you taking away? Not what they take taking away. What are you taking away? Seventy to eighty percent of litigation happens because of poor communication. Because yeah. we're not talking to patients. That's why they come. They want answers, so they do it the legal route and the expensive route for the health department. <laughs> what are you taking away, ma'am? That the staff attitude should change. But that's and that's the challenge. How is it going to change? How? How are we going to? Do you think it takes a lot? Uh, communication. How you treat the patient? How you counsel the patient? And you have you share it with and that goes with role modeling. Yes. And it goes, I mean, you guys as the leaders out there, how you treat your subordinates. Mm -hmm. Are you, do you do that to them? And then they in turn go do it to the patients. Okay. Ma'am? Lost. Importance of the carers. Care of the carers. Okay. All right. And that's something that, that can often be done in house. You know, if, if, uh, you can, there, there are different ways that one can sit together. In the old days, people used to start a, a clinic with a prayer. Mm -hmm. Or a song. Or a song. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a way of connecting and saying we are together. Um, of, of, of making a space where you can debrief, where you can talk about the week. And not just about, well, we ran out of drugs. Or so-and-so was sick again. Mm. But we can talk about how do we feel about this week? How are we feeling in ourselves? What worked? What didn't? That's a way of, of looking after the, the team and the people within the team. And yeah. caring for them as people, yeah. not as providers. So, so you said your son wasn't so well. How's it going? Mm. Something as simple as that. Mm. Just interest in people mm. makes them feel cared for. Just listening to people without you having to say anything. Just listening. Being with them. Being with them. I'm talking about your colleagues here now. I'm not talking about patients. I'm talking about your colleagues. Just being there. One other point is that regarding that patient as you would your family, you just say to yourself, if this was my mother or this was my sister, how would I react to her? And you finally come up with a very, very different, different reaction to the patient. Absolutely. Absolutely. Any final comments or burning Yes, sir. That question one is a very interesting module we have now. Because, you know, in, uh, in our institution, that is the things we are having. 
I remember a week ago we had a one year old, baby Bravi that was an operative. Mm -hmm. And I went to see the patient and uh, she couldn't even allow me to do a PV. So, and the sisters told me that no doctor, you can go, you know, we're going to assist him, we're going we're gonna to see this patient, we're going to assess her. And what happened later, I was just worried. I came back, I think, uh, a couple of hours later to ask them, how is the patient doing? They told me that no, the patient ended up delivered, but I asked them, how is the patient delivered? And they said, no, you know, the sisters has to, to hit on the patient. You know, has to Oh no! Okay. Nice, right. and I said, that was really, really so these yeah. are the things that happen, yeah. and all of us need really. Exactly, and so also I'm our complacency. When we see people do that. What do we do about it? We just allow it to happen? No. No, that's what we do. We we don't address it. We don't address it. So. <laughs> and but it, I think the other point is that there was an opportunity early on in the labour. You can't see somebody who's uncooperative or rude. What is, we need to inquire, what's behind that? Mm. What are the feelings behind that? It might just be terror, fear, yeah. loneliness. If we deal with the feeling behind the behavior, you might find the rest of the labor is much easier for everybody. The delivery is much, much easier. Um, and we're lucky, we often have a good few hours mm. yeah. in which to work with somebody um, and understand what's behind, <coughs> what, what are the feelings here? And if I can understand the feelings, not the behavior, then I can shift this behavior, this, this labor into a certain way. Yeah. Okay. Good. We're going to have to cut it, but we can talk afterwards. Okay, yeah. quick, last one. Uh, what I, uh, I was interested in uh, is that uh, sometimes we know we just uh, uh, forgotten like managers to encourage the staff, like if there was some negative incident or some massive whatever. Uh, thing that just happened to encourage the staff. Let's say they did, and then they win. Let's say, and then just encourage, like, uh, congratulate them, and then the moral of the staff. They yeah, that will. Yeah, because the, the, the positive. The triumphs. Yeah, yeah, the triumphs. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, and not just the negative attention that managers tend to give. Mm -hmm. Right. That's that's mentoring and leadership. When you can when you can pick up the positives, and you can show look everybody, look how this person managed this difficult situation very well. Let's and well done to that, and well know. done to you yeah. for yeah. 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 doing so well. Thank you. Right. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you. Nice time. Thank you.